The Adventure of the Lion's Mane by Arthur Conan Doyle Narrated by Peter Silverleaf It is a most singular thing that a problem, which was certainly as abstruse and unusual as any which I have faced in my long professional career, should have come to me after my retirement and be brought, as it were, to my very door. It occurred after my withdrawal to my little Sussex home, when I had given myself up entirely to that soothing life of nature for which I had so often yearned during the long years spent amid the gloom of London. At this period of my life the good Watson had passed almost beyond my ken. An occasional weekend visit was the most that I ever saw of him. Thus I must act as my own chronicler. Ah! Had he but been with me, how much he might have made of so wonderful a happening, and of my eventual triumph against every difficulty. As it is, however, I must needs tell my tale in my own plain way, showing by my words each step upon the difficult road which lay before me as I searched for the mystery of the lion's mane. My villa is situated upon the southern slope of the downs, commanding a great view of the channel. At this point the coastline is entirely of chalk cliffs, which can only be descended by a single long, tortuous path, which is steep and slippery. At the bottom of the path lie a hundred yards of pebbles and shingle, even when the tide is at full. Here and there, however, there are curves and hollows which make splendid swimming pools, filled afresh with each flow. This admirable beach extends for some miles in each direction, save only at one point where the little cove and village of Fulworth break the line. My house is lonely. I, my old housekeeper, and my bees have the estate all to ourselves. Half a mile off, however, is old Harold Stackhurst's well-known coaching establishment, the Gables, quite a large place, which contains some score of young fellows preparing for various professions with a staff of several masters. Stackhurst himself was a well-known rowing blue in his day, and an excellent all-round scholar. He and I were always friendly from the day I came to the coast, and he was the one man who was on such terms with me that we could drop in on each other in the evenings without an invitation. Towards the end of July 1907, there was a severe gale, the wind blowing up channel, heaping the seas to the base of the cliffs and leaving a lagoon at the turn of the tide. On the morning of which I speak, the wind had abated, and all nature was newly washed and fresh. It was impossible to work upon so delightful a day, and I strolled out before breakfast to enjoy the exquisite air. I walked along the cliff path which led to the steep descent to the beach. As I walked I heard a shout behind me, and there was Harold Stackhurst waving his hand in cheery greeting. What a morning, Mr. Holmes! I thought I should see you out. "'Going for a swim, I see?' "'At your old tricks again?' he laughed, patting his bulging pocket. "'Yes, Macpherson started early, and I expect I may find him there.' Fitzroy Macpherson was the science master, a fine, upstanding young fellow whose life had been crippled by heart trouble following rheumatic fever. He was a natural athlete, however, and excelled in every game which did not throw too great a strain upon him. Summer and winter he went for his swim, and, as I am a swimmer myself, I have often joined him. At this moment we saw the man himself. His head showed above the edge of the cliff where the path ends. Then his whole figure appeared at the top, staggering like a drunken man. The next instant he threw up his hands and, with a terrible cry, fell upon his face. Stackhurst and I rushed forward. It may have been fifty yards, and turned him on his back. He was obviously dying. Those glazed sunken eyes and dreadful livid cheeks could mean nothing else. One glimmer of life came into his face for an instant, and he uttered two or three words with an eager air of warning. They were slurred and indistinct, but to my ear the last of them, which burst in a shriek from his lips, were The Lion's Mane. It was utterly irrelevant and unintelligible, and yet I could twist the sound into no other sense. Then he half raised himself from the ground, threw his arms into the air, and fell forward on his side. He was dead. My companion was paralysed by the sudden horror of it, 
but I, as may well be imagined, had every sense on the alert. And I had need, for it was speedily evident that we were in the presence of an extraordinary case. The man was dressed only in his Burberry overcoat, his trousers, and an unlaced pair of canvas shoes. As he fell over, his Burberry, which had been simply thrown round his shoulders, slipped off, exposing his trunk. We stared at it in amazement. His back was covered with dark red lines, as though he had been terribly flogged by a thin wire scourge. The instrument with which this punishment had been inflicted was clearly flexible, for the long, angry wheels curved round his shoulders and ribs. There was blood dripping down his chin, for he had bitten through his lower lip in the paroxysm of his agony. His drawn and distorted face told how terrible that agony had been. I was kneeling and stack her standing by the body when a shadow fell across us, and we found that Ian Murdoch was by our side. Murdoch was the mathematical coach of the establishment, a tall, dark, thin man, so taciturn and aloof that none could be said to have been his friend. He seemed to live in some high, abstract region of surds and conic sections, with little to connect him with ordinary life. He was looked upon as an oddity by the students, and would have been their butt, but there was some strange outlandish blood in the man, which showed itself not only in his coal-black eyes and swarthy face, but also in occasional outbreaks of temper, which could only be described as ferocious. On one occasion, being plagued by a little dog belonging to Macpherson, he had caught the creature up and hurled it through the plate-glass window, an action for which Stackhurst would certainly have given him his dismissal had he not been a very valuable teacher. Such was the strange, complex man who now appeared beside us. He seemed to be honestly shocked at the sight before him, though the incident of the dog may show that there was no great sympathy between the dead man and himself. Poor fellow, poor fellow, what can I do? How can I help? Were you with him? Can you tell us what has happened? No, no, I was late this morning. I was not on the beach at all. I have come straight from the gables. What can I do? You can hurry to the police station at Fulworth. Report the matter at once. Without a word, he made off at top speed, and I proceeded to take the matter in hand, while Stackhurst, dazed at this tragedy, remained by the body. My first task, naturally, was to note who was on the beach. From the top of the path I could see the whole sweep of it, and it was absolutely deserted, save that two or three dark figures could be seen far away, moving towards the village of Fulworth. Having satisfied myself upon this point, I walked slowly down the path. There was clay or soft marl mixed with the chalk, and every here and there I saw the same footstep, both ascending and descending. No one else had gone down to the beach by this track that morning. At one place I observed the print of an open hand with the fingers towards the incline. This could only mean that poor Macpherson had fallen as he ascended. There were rounded depressions too which suggested that he had come down upon his knees more than once. At the bottom of the path was the considerable lagoon left by the retreating tide. At the side of it Macpherson had undressed, for there lay his towel on a rock. It was folded and dry, so that it would seem that, after all, he had never entered the water. Once or twice, as I hunted around amid the hard shingle, I came on little patches of sand where the print of his canvas shoe, and also of his naked foot, could be seen. The latter fact proved that he had made all ready to bathe, though the towel indicated that he had not actually done so. And here was the problem clearly defined, as strange a one as had ever confronted me. The man had not been on the beach more than a quarter of an hour at the most. Stackhurst had followed him from the gables, so there could be no doubt about that. He had gone to bathe and had stripped, as the naked footsteps showed. Then he had suddenly huddled on his clothes again, they were all dishevelled and unfastened, and he had returned without bathing, or at any rate without drying himself. And the reason for his change of purpose had been that he had been scourged in some savage, inhuman fashion, tortured, until he bit his lip through in his agony, and was left with only strength enough to crawl away and to die. Who had done this barbarous deed? There were, it is true, small grottos and caves in the base of the cliffs, but the low sun shone directly into them, and there was no place for concealment. Then, again, there were those distant figures on the beach. 
They seem too far away to have been connected with the crime, and the broad lagoon in which Macpherson had intended to bathe lay between him and them, lapping up to the rocks. On the sea, two or three fishing boats were at no great distance. Their occupants might be examined at our leisure. There were several roads for inquiry, but none which led to any very obvious goal. When I at last returned to the body, I found that a little group of wandering folk had gathered round it. Stackhurst was, of course, still there, and Ian Murdoch had just arrived with Anderson, the village constable, a big, ginger-moustached man of the slow, solid Sussex breed, a breed which covers much good sense under a heavy, silent exterior. He listened to everything, took note of all we said, and finally drew me aside. I'm glad of your advice, Mr. Holmes. This is a big thing for me to handle, and I'll hear of it from Lewis if I go wrong. I advised him to send for his immediate superior and for a doctor, also to allow nothing to be moved and as few fresh footmarks as possible to be made until they came. In the meantime, I searched the dead man's pockets. There were his handkerchief, a large knife and a small folding card case. From this projected a slip of paper which I unfolded and handed to the constable. There was written on it in a scrawling feminine hand, I will be there, you may be sure, Mordy. It read like a love affair, an assignation, though when and where were a blank. The constable replaced it in the card case and returned it with the other things to the pockets of the Burberry. Then, as nothing more suggested itself, I walked back to my house for breakfast, having first arranged that the base of the cliffs should be thoroughly searched. Stackhurst was round in an hour or two to tell me that the body had been removed to the gables where the inquest would be held. He brought with him some serious and definite news. As I expected, nothing had been found in the small caves below the cliff, but he had examined the papers in Macpherson's desk, and there were several which showed an intimate correspondence with a certain Miss Maud Bellamy of Fulworth. We had then established the identity of the writer of the note. The police have the letters, he explained. I could not bring them but there is no doubt that it was a serious love affair. I see no reason, however, to connect it with that horrible happening, save, indeed, that the lady had made an appointment with him. But hardly at a bathing pool, which all of you are in the habit of using, I remarked. It is a mere chance, said he, that several of the students were not with Macpherson. Was it mere chance? Stackhurst knit his brows in thought. Ian Murdoch held them back, said he. He would insist upon some algebraic demonstration before breakfast. Poor chap, he is dreadfully cut up about it all. And yet I gather they were not friends. At one time they were not. But for a year or more Murdoch has been as near to Macpherson as he ever could be to anyone. He is not of a very sympathetic disposition by nature. So I understand. I seem to remember your telling me once about a quarrel over the ill usage of a dog. That blew over all right. But left some vindictive feeling, perhaps? No, no, I am sure they were real friends. Well, then, we must explore the matter of the girl. Do you know her? Everyone knows her. She is the beauty of the neighbourhood, a real beauty, Holmes, who would draw attention everywhere. I knew that Macpherson was attracted by her, but I had no notion that it had gone so far as these letters would seem to indicate. But who is she? She is the daughter of old Tom Bellamy, who owns all the boats and bathing cots at Fulworth. He was a fisherman to start with, but is now a man of some substance. He and his son William run the business. Shall we walk into Fulworth and see them? On what pretext? Oh, we can easily find a pretext. After all, this poor man did not ill-use himself in this outrageous way. Some human hand was on the handle of that scourge, if indeed it was a scourge which inflicted the injuries. His circle of acquaintance in this lonely place was surely limited. Let us follow it up in every direction, and we can hardly fail to come upon the motive, which in turn should lead us to the criminal. It would have been a pleasant walk across the time-scented downs had our minds not been poisoned by the tragedy we had witnessed. The village of Fulworth lies in a hollow curving in a semicircle round the bay. Behind the old-fashioned hamlet, several modern houses have been built upon the rising ground. 
It was to one of these that Stackhurst guided me. That's the haven, as Bellamy called it, the one with the corner tower and slate roof. Not bad for a man who started with nothing, but... By Jove, look at that! The garden gate of the haven had opened, and a man had emerged. There was no mistaking that tall, angular, straggling figure. It was Ian Murdoch, the mathematician. A moment later we confronted him upon the road. Hello, said Stackhurst. The man nodded, gave us a sideways glance from his curious dark eyes, and would have passed us, but his principal pulled him up. What were you doing there? he asked. Murdoch's face flushed with anger. I am your subordinate, sir, under your roof. I am not aware that I owe you any account of my private actions. Stackhurst's nerves were near the surface after all he had endured. Otherwise, perhaps, he would have waited. Now he lost his temper completely. In the circumstances, your answer is pure impertinence, Mr. Murdoch. Your own question might perhaps come under the same heading. This is not the first time I have had to overlook your insubordinate ways. It will certainly be the last. You will kindly make fresh arrangements for your future as speedily as you can. I had intended to do so. I have lost today the only person who made the gables habitable. He strode off upon his way, while Stackhurst, with angry eyes, stood glaring after him. Is he not an impossible, intolerable man? he cried. The one thing that impressed itself forcibly upon my mind was that Mr. Ian Murdoch was taking the first chance to open a path of escape from the scene of the crime. Suspicion, vague and nebulous, was now beginning to take outline in my mind. Perhaps the visit to the Bellamy's might throw some further light upon the matter. Stackhurst pulled himself together, and we went forward to the house. Mr. Bellamy proved to be a middle-aged man with a flaming red beard. He seemed to be in a very angry mood, and his face was soon as florid as his hair. No, sir, I do not desire any particulars. My son here, indicating a powerful young man with a heavy, sullen face in the corner of the sitting-room, is of one mind with me that Mr. Macpherson's attentions to Maud were insulting. Yes, sir. The word marriage was never mentioned, and yet there were letters and meetings, and a great deal more of which neither of us could approve. She has no mother, and we are her only guardians. We are determined. But the words were taken from his mouth by the appearance of the lady herself. There was no gain saying that she would have graced any assembly in the world. Who could have imagined that so rare a flower could grow from such a root, and in such an atmosphere? Women have seldom been an attraction to me, for my brain has always governed my heart, but I could not look upon her perfect clear-cut face, with all the soft freshness of the downlands in her delicate colouring, without realising that no young man would cross her path unscathed. She was the girl who had pushed open the door and stood now, wide-eyed and intense, in front of Harold Stackhurst. I know already that Fitzroy is dead, she said. Do not be afraid to tell me the particulars. This other gentleman of yours, let us know the news, explained the father. There is no reason why my sister should be brought into the matter, growled the younger man. The sister turned a sharp, fierce look upon him. This is my business, William. Kindly leave me to manage it in my own way. By all accounts there has been a crime committed. If I can help to show who did it, it is the least I can do for him who is gone. She listened to a short account from my companion with a composed concentration which showed to me that she possessed strong character as well as great beauty. Maud Bellamy will always remain in my memory as a most complete and remarkable woman. It seems that she already knew me by sight, for she turned to me at the end. Bring them to justice, Mr. Holmes. You have my sympathy and my help, whoever they may be. It seemed to me that she glanced defiantly at her father and brother as she spoke. Thank you, said I. I value a woman's instinct in such matters. You use the word they. You think that more than one was concerned? I knew Mr. McPherson well enough to be aware that he was a brave and a strong man. No single person could ever have inflicted such an outrage upon him. 
might I have one word with you alone? I tell you, Maud, not to mix yourself up in the matter, cried her father angrily. She looked at me helplessly. What can I do? The whole world will know the facts presently, so there can be no harm if I discuss them here, said I. I should have preferred privacy, but if your father will not allow it, he must share the deliberations. Then I spoke of the note which had been found in the dead man's pocket. It is sure to be produced at the inquest. May I ask you to throw any light upon it that you can? I see no reason for mystery, she answered. We were engaged to be married, and we only kept it a secret because Fitzroy's uncle, who is very old and said to be dying, might have disinherited him if he had married against his wish. There was no other reason. You could have told us, growled Mr. Bellamy. So I would, father, if you had ever shown sympathy. I object to my girl picking up with men outside her own station. It was your prejudice against him which prevented us from telling you. As to this appointment, she fumbled in her dress and produced a crumpled note. It was in answer to this. Dearest, ran the message, the old place on the beach just after sunset on Tuesday. It is the only time I can get away. F.M. Tuesday was today and I had meant to meet him tonight. I turned over the paper. This never came by post. How did you get it? I would rather not answer that question. It has really nothing to do with the matter which you are investigating, but anything which bears upon that I will most freely answer. She was as good as her word, but there was nothing which was helpful in our investigation. She had no reason to think that her fiancé had any hidden enemy, but she admitted that she had had several warm admirers. May I ask if Mr. Ian Murdoch was one of them? She blushed and seemed confused. There was a time when I thought he was, but that was all changed when he understood the relations between Fitzroy and myself. Again the shadow round this strange man seemed to me to be taking more definite shape. His record must be examined. His rooms must be privately searched. Stackhurst was a willing collaborator, for in his mind also suspicions were forming. We returned from our visit to the haven with the hope that one free end of this tangled skein was already in our hands. A week passed. The inquest had thrown no light upon the matter and had been adjourned for further evidence. Stackhurst had made discreet inquiry about his subordinate, and there had been a superficial search of his room, but without result. Personally, I had gone over the whole ground again, both physically and mentally, but with no new conclusions. In all my chronicles the reader will find no case which brought me so completely to the limit of my powers. Even my imagination could conceive no solution to the mystery. And then there came the incident of the dog. It was my old housekeeper who heard of it first, by that strange wireless by which such people collect the news of the countryside. Sad story, this, sir, about MacPherson's dog, said she one evening. I do not encourage such conversations, but the words arrested my attention. What of Mr. MacPherson's dog? Dead, sir, died of grief for its master. Who told you this? Why, sir, everyone is talking of it. It took on terrible and has eaten nothing for a week. Then today two of the young gentlemen from the Gables found it dead, down on the beach, sir, at the very place where its master met its end. At the very place. The words stood out clear in my memory. Some dim perception that the matter was vital rose in my mind. That the dog should die was after the beautiful, faithful nature of dogs. But, in the very place, why should this lonely beach be fatal to it? Was it possible that it also had been sacrificed to some revengeful feud? Was it possible? Yes, the perception was dim, but already something was building up in my mind. In a few minutes I was on my way to the gables where I found Stackhurst in his study. 
At my request, he sent for Sudbury and Blount, the two students who had found the dog. Yes, it lay on the very edge of the pool, said one of them. It must have followed the trail of its dead master. I saw the faithful little creature, an Airedale terrier, laid out upon the mat in the hall. The body was stiff and rigid, the eyes projecting and the limbs contorted. There was agony in every line of it. From the gables I walked down to the bathing pool. The sun had sunk and the shadow of the great cliff lay black across the water, which glimmered dully like a sheet of lead. The place was deserted and there was no sign of life save for two seabirds circling and screaming overhead. In the fading light I could dimly make out the little dog's spur upon the sand round the very rock on which his master's towel had been laid. For a long time I stood in deep meditation while the shadows grew darker around me. My mind was filled with racing thoughts. You have known what it is to be in a nightmare in which you feel that there is some all-important thing for which you search, and which you know is there, though it remains forever just beyond your reach. That was how I felt that evening as I stood alone by that place of death. Then, at last, I turned and walked slowly homeward. I had just reached the top of the path when it came to me. Like a flash, I remembered the thing for which I had so eagerly and vainly grasped. You will know, or Watson has written in vain, that I hold a vast store of out-of-the-way knowledge without scientific system, but very available for the needs of my work. My mind is like a crowded box-room with packets of all sorts stowed away therein, so many that I may well have but a vague perception of what was there. I had known that there was something which might bear upon this matter. It was still vague, but at least I knew how I could make it clear. It was monstrous, incredible, and yet it was always a possibility. I would test it to the full. There is a great garret in my little house which is stuffed with books. It was into this that I plunged and rummaged for an hour. At the end of that time I emerged with a little chocolate and silver volume. Eagerly I turned up the chapter of which I had a dim remembrance. Yes, it was indeed a far-fetched and unlikely proposition, and yet I could not be at rest until I had made sure if it might indeed be so. It was late when I retired, with my mind eagerly awaiting the work of the morrow. But that work met with an annoying interruption. I had hardly swallowed my early cup of tea and was starting for the beach when I had a call from Inspector Bardell of the Sussex Constabulary a steady, solid, bovine man with thoughtful eyes, which looked at me now with a very troubled expression. "'I know your immense experience, sir,' said he. "'This is quite unofficial, of course, and need go no farther, but I am fairly up against it in this Macpherson case. The question is, shall I make an arrest, or shall I not?' "'Meaning Mr. Ian Murdoch?' "'Yes, sir.' There really is no one else when you come to think of it. That's the advantage of this solitude. We narrow it down to a very small compass. If he did not do it, then who did? What have you against him? He had leaned along the same furrows as I had. There was Murdoch's character and the mystery which seemed to hang round the man. His furious burst of temper, as shown in the instant of the dog. The fact that he had quarrelled with Macpherson in the past, and that there was some reason to think that he might have resented his attentions to Miss Bellamy. He had all my points, but no fresh ones, save that Murdoch seemed to be making every preparation for departure. What would be my position if I let him slip away with all this evidence against him? The burly, phlegmatic man was sorely troubled in his mind. Consider, I said, all the essential gaps in your case. On the morning of the crime he can surely prove an alibi. He had been with his scholars till the last moment, and within a few minutes of Macpherson's appearance he came upon us from behind. Then bear in mind the absolute impossibility that he could single-handed have inflicted this outrage upon a man quite as strong as himself. Finally, there is this question of the instrument with which these injuries were inflicted. What could it be but a scourge or flexible whip of some sort? Have you examined the marks? I asked. I have seen them, so has the doctor. But I have examined them very carefully with a lens. They have peculiarities. What are they, Mr. Holmes? I stepped to my bureau and brought out an enlarged photograph. 
This is my method in such cases, I explained. You certainly do things thoroughly, Mr. Holmes. I should hardly be what I am if I did not. Now let us consider this wheel which extends round the right shoulder. Do you observe nothing remarkable? I can't say I do. Surely it is evident that it is unequal in its intensity. There is a dot of extravasated blood here and another there. There are similar indications in this other wheel down here. What can that mean? I have no idea. Have you? Perhaps I have. Perhaps I haven't. I may be able to say more soon. Anything which will define what made that mark will bring us a long way towards the criminal. It is, of course, an absurd idea, said the policeman. But if a red-hot net of wire had been laid across the back, then these better-marked points would represent where the meshes crossed each other. A most ingenious comparison. Or shall we say a very stiff cat o nine tails with small hard knots upon it? By Jove, Mr. Holmes, I think you have hit it. Or there may be some very different cause, Mr. Bardell. But your case is far too weak for an arrest. Besides, we have those last words. The lion's mane. I have wondered whether Ian... Yes, I have considered that. If the second word had borne any resemblance to Murdoch, but it did not. He gave it almost in a shriek. I am sure that it was Maine. Have you no alternative, Mr. Holmes? Perhaps I have, but I do not care to discuss it until there is something more solid to discuss. And when will that be? In an hour, possibly less. The inspector rubbed his chin and looked at me with dubious eyes. I wish I could see what was in your mind, Mr. Holmes. Perhaps it's those fishing boats. No, no, they were too far out. Well, then, is it Bellamy and that big son of his? They were not too sweet upon Mr. MacPherson. Could they have done him a mischief? No, no, you won't draw me until I am ready, said I with a smile. Now, Inspector, we each have our own work to do. Perhaps if you were to meet me here at midday? So far we had got when there came the tremendous interruption which was the beginning of the end. My outer door was flung open, there were blundering footsteps in the passage, and Ian Murdoch staggered into the room, pallid, dishevelled, his clothes in wild disorder, clawing with his bony hands at the furniture to hold himself erect. Brandy! Brandy! he gasped, and fell groaning upon the sofa. He was not alone. Behind him came Stackhurst, hatless and panting, almost as distraught as his companion. Yes, yes, Brandy, he cried. The man is at his last gasp. It was all I could do to bring him here. He fainted twice upon the way. Half a tumbler of the raw spirit brought about a wondrous change. He pushed himself up on one arm and swung his coat from his shoulders. For God's sake, oil, opium, morphia, he cried, anything to ease this infernal agony. The inspector and I cried out at the sight. There, criss-crossed upon the man's naked shoulder, was the same strange reticulated pattern of red inflamed lines which had been the death mark of Fitzroy MacPherson. The pain was evidently terrible and was more than local, for the sufferer's breathing would stop for a time, his face would turn black, and then with loud gasps he would clap his hand to his heart while his brow dropped beads of sweat. At any moment he might die. More and more brandy was poured down his throat, each fresh dose bringing him back to life. Pads of cotton wool soaked in salad oil seemed to take the agony from the strange wounds. At last his head fell heavily upon the cushion. Exhausted nature had taken refuge in its last storehouse of vitality. It was half asleep and half a faint, but at least it was ease from pain. To question him had been impossible, but the moment we were assured of his condition, Stackhurst turned upon me. My God, he cried, what is it, Holmes, what is it? Where did you find him? Down on the beach, exactly where poor MacPherson met his end. If this man's heart had been weak as MacPherson's was, he would not be here now. More than once I thought he was gone as I brought him up. It was too far to the gable, so I made for you. Did you see him on the beach? I was walking on the cliff when I heard his cry. He was at the edge of the water, reeling about like a drunken man. 
I ran down, threw some clothes about him, and brought him up. For heaven's sake, Holmes, use all the powers you have, and spare no pains to lift the curse from this place, for life is becoming unendurable. Can you, with all your worldwide reputation, do nothing for us? I think I can, Stackhurst. Come with me now, and you, Inspector, come along. We will see if we cannot deliver this murderer into your hands. Leaving the unconscious man in the charge of my housekeeper, we all three went down to the deadly lagoon. On the shingle there was piled a little heap of towels and clothes left by the stricken man. Slowly I walked round the edge of the water, my comrades in Indian rifle behind me. Most of the pool was quite shallow, but under the cliff where the beach was hollowed out it was four or five feet deep. It was to this part that a swimmer would naturally go for it formed a beautiful pellucid green pool, as clear as crystal. A line of rocks lay above it at the base of the cliff, and along this I led the way, peering eagerly into the depths beneath me. I had reached the deepest and stillest pool when my eyes caught that for which they were searching, and I burst into a shout of triumph. Cyanea, I cried, Cyanea, behold, the lion's mane! The strange object at which I pointed did, indeed, look like a tangled mass torn from the mane of a lion. It lay upon a rocky shelf some three feet under the water, a curious, waving, vibrating, hairy creature with streaks of silver among its yellow tresses. It pulsated with a slow, heavy dilation and contraction. "'It has done mischief enough. Its day is over,' I cried. "'Help me, Stackhurst. Let us end the murderer forever.' There was a big boulder just above the ledge, and we pushed it until it fell with a tremendous splash into the water. When the ripples had cleared, we saw that it had settled upon the ledge below. One flapping edge of yellow membrane showed that our victim was beneath it. A thick, oily scum oozed out from below the stone and stained the water round, rising slowly to the surface. "'Well, this gets me,' cried the inspector. "'What is it, Mr. Holmes?' I am born and bred in these parts, but I never saw such a thing. It don't belong to Sussex. Just as well for Sussex, I remarked. It may have been the southwest gale that brought it up. Come back to my house, both of you, and I will give you the terrible experience of one who has good reason to remember his own meeting with the same peril of the seas. When we reached my study, we found that Murdoch was so far recovered that he could sit up. He was dazed in mind, and every now and then was shaken by a paroxysm of pain. In broken words he explained that he had no notion what had occurred to him, save that terrific pangs had suddenly shot through him, and that it had taken all his fortitude to reach the bank. "'Here is a book,' I said, taking up the little volume, which first brought light into what might have been forever dark. It is Out of Doors, by the famous observer J. G. Wood. Wood himself very nearly perished from contact with this vile creature, so he wrote with a very full knowledge. Cyanea capillata is the miscreant's full name, and he can be as dangerous to life as, and far more painful than, the bite of the cobra. Let me briefly give this extract. If the bather should see a loose, roundish mass of tawny membranes and fibres, something like very large handfuls of lion's mane and silver paper, let him beware, for this is the fearful stinger, Cyanea capillata. Could our sinister acquaintance be more clearly described? He goes on to tell of his own encounter with one when swimming off the coast of Kent. He found that the creature radiated almost invisible filaments to the distance of fifty feet, and that anyone within that circumference from the deadly centre was in danger of death. Even at a distance the effect upon wood was almost fatal. The multitudinous threads caused light scarlet lines upon the skin, which on closer examination resolved into minute dots or pustules, each dot charged, as it were, with a red-hot needle making its way through the nerves. The local pain, as he explains, the least part of the exquisite torment. Pang shot through the chest, causing me to fall as if struck by a bullet. The pulsation would cease, and then the heart would give six or seven leaps, as if it would force its way through the chest. It nearly killed him, although he had only been exposed to it in the disturbed ocean, and not in the narrow, calm waters of a bathing pool. 
He says that he could hardly recognize himself afterwards, so white, wrinkled, and shriveled was his face. He gulped down brandy, a whole bottleful, and it seems to have saved his life. There is the book, Inspector. I leave it with you, and you cannot doubt that it contains a full explanation of the tragedy of poor MacPherson. And incidentally exonerates me, remarked Ian Murdoch with a wry smile. I do not blame you, Inspector, nor you, Mr. Holmes, for your suspicions were natural. I feel that on the very eve of my arrest I have only cleared myself by sharing the fate of my poor friend. No, Mr. Murdoch, I was already upon the track, and had I been out as early as I intended, I might well have saved you from this terrific experience. But how did you know, Mr. Holmes? I am an omnivorous reader with a strangely retentive memory for trifles. That phrase, the lion's mane, haunted my mind. I knew that I had seen it somewhere in an unexpected context. You have seen that it does describe the creature? I have no doubt that it was floating on the water when Macpherson saw it, and that this phrase was the only one by which he could convey to us a warning as to the creature which had been his death. "'Then at least I am cleared,' said Murdoch, rising slowly to his feet. "'There are one or two words of explanation which I should give, "'for I know the direction in which your inquiries have run. "'It is true that I love this lady, "'but from the day when she chose my friend Macpherson, "'my one desire was to help her to happiness. "'I was well content to stand aside and act as their go-between. "'Often I carried their messages.' and it was because I was in their confidence and because she was so dear to me that I hastened to tell her of my friend's death, lest someone should forestall me in a more sudden and heartless manner. She would not tell you, sir, of our relations lest you should disapprove and I might suffer. But with your leave I must try to get back to the gables, for my bed will be very welcome. Stackhurst held out his hand. Our nerves have all been at concert pitch, said he. Forgive what is past, Murdoch. We shall understand each other better in the future. They passed out together with their arms linked in friendly fashion. The inspector remained staring at me in silence with his ox-like eyes. Well, you've done it, he cried at last. I had read of you, but I never believed it. It's wonderful. I was forced to shake my head. To accept such praise was to lower one's own standards. I was slow at the outset, culpably slow. Had the body been found in the water, I could hardly have missed it. It was the towel which misled me. The poor fellow had never thought to dry himself, and so I in turn was led to believe that he had never been in the water. Why then should the attack of any water creature suggest itself to me? That was where I went astray. Well, well, Inspector. I have often chaffed you gentlemen of the police force, but Cyanea Capillata very nearly avenged Scotland Yard. <laughs>